on the assumption that it's legal, and it may well not be, would you ask the cabin crew of a domestic commercial flight if you could promote your business over the plane's PA? Or, on the assumption it's not too cold, would you swim your product out to passing kayakers? <laughs> well, today's guest has done both of those crazy marketing ideas, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. It's another unconventional episode 663 of the 14-year-old award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Well, I say welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of Do You Believe in Your Product Enough Marketing? I'm your host, Timbo Reed, and I have an insatiable curiosity for uncovering marketing ideas that help businesses just like yours to grow. And I do that by having a weekly, in-depth, interesting, fun, and challenging conversation with successful business owners who have very, very kindly walked the path before us. You, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner, ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. As per usual, team, there's marketing G-O-L-D, dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Be sure to hang around after the interview for an update on your favourite marketing podcast. Hmm, interesting. Speaking of which, if you're benefiting from this show in any way, shape or form, if you love to talk marketing and are always on the lookout for the next big or small idea to grow that beautiful business of yours, then try my small business owner membership free for seven days. Nothing to lose, no lock-ins, no nonsense. Why? Great question. Well, in the past week, I've posted a commentary and link to the best interview I've ever heard yet about the all-important customer experience, a short video snippet of my favourite part of last week's chat with Renee Bunster, along with another video snippet all about how to create a celebrity service with Jacob Spencer of Miniskips. That was a couple of episodes ago. I've also posted a rant on how business owners just like you could be more strategic in deciding their opening hours. Plus, there's 45 marketing ideas that I've captured on video. There's a mountain of video interviews I've done and more short video excerpts from my favourite interviews and your favourite interviews. Some productivity tool reviews and the odd peek behind the scenes. Very odd, I can assure you. And like I said, I'm adding stimulating marketing content every single week. And if none of that interests you and you just like to make a contribution to the running costs of this show, then who am I to say no? For more info, head over to patreon.com forward slash marketing podcast. There's also a link in the show notes. And thanks to all of you who've already joined. Every, every little bit helps to bring the best business and marketing inspirations going around straight to your door. Check it out for free for seven days over at patreon.com forward slash marketing podcast. <laughs> Today's special guest is Parker Olson, a serial entrepreneur with a passion for unconventional marketing strategies. And when I say serial entrepreneur, I mean this in both respects. He's the founder of a granola business called Forage. From swimming product samples out to passing kayakers to taking control of the cabin crew's microphone on domestic commercial flights, not just one to travelling the length of the United States in his forage-branded Mazda van in order to visit buyers, Parker is an absolute ninja at breaking through the clutter and getting his brand noticed, all whilst spending as little as possible on his marketing. But boy, does he get a great bang for his buck. Topics covered include, of course, unconventional marketing ideas and the process Parker uses to arrive at them how he measures the ROI of unconventional marketing, why a $10 whiteboard shouldn't be underestimated, and so much more. As always, you'll find a video snippet from this interview that I feel is super interesting over at patreon.com forward slash marketing podcast. But right now, enough from me. Let's go meet Parker. Parker Olson, welcome finally to the Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Thanks, Timbo. I can't believe you're real. (laughs) Neither can I. Now, Parker... We're here to talk about unconventional marketing. However, before we get to that, I want to understand, along with my listeners, just to what extent 
forage is your life? I would say I, I, at this point, people know me as like the granola man or, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit here or as the airplane guy or the van guy. And these are all referencing specific things I've done to build brand awareness or open up distribution. Um, and yeah, I've sacrificed my life in several ways for the brand that I'm, that I'm sure we'll touch on. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to give too many sneak peeks here, but yeah, I would say on some levels, we're, we're one in the same, Timbo. I'm, I, I dream about uh, granola and, and processing and selling granola <laughs> and making granola now. So, Well, let's go back in time. You spent 18 months. It just give us a sense of age. You're not the oldest bloke going around right now. How old are you? How old, how old are you? <laughs> I just turned 28 last week. You're 28. So at some point, you spent an entire 18 months, from what I can understand, uh, living out of a van, um, travelling uh, the country, uh, just promoting the forage brand. Just tell us about that time and why you did it. Yeah, well, so so the eight, the eighteen months specifically was was trying different nutritional diets. That was almost for fun. Like I, I was I was working corporate job. I, I feel like when I listen to the pod, it's like a lot of like you hear a lot of this where people are working a corporate job and and you just know deep down that like you're just unfulfilled. There's there's a lack of fulfillment, <laughs> and I think yeah. a lot of people just sort of hits them in the face, and they're like, I have to go do something else. Um, so I was working a corporate job and I just got really interested by in nutrition. And I was like, you know what? Well, I don't understand why people are vegan. I'll go vegan for 30 days. Let's see what happens. Did that for 30 days. And then I just kept doing that and trying different nutritional diets and documenting how I felt and became obsessed with, with mushrooms, you know, functional mushrooms and, and supplementing with them. I felt really, really good. Um, and so that, that was sort of like the first test or experiment for me that really got me interested in nutrition and, and compelled to start a food brand. So is, at this point, are you just doing a little sort of nutritional test on on yourself to see if you can feel better, be more productive, have clearer thoughts, all that kind of stuff? Or was the end goal, no, I'm going to do this research and at the back end of it, start a business? It was definitely more about nutritional interest. I was trying to start other businesses at the time. So I actually started a, a reversible pant company that, you know, didn't really go anywhere. My takeaway from that was like... Did, did you say reversible pan or pant? <laughs> reversible pants so you could like flip the pants inside that's out dis- different that's pattern. disgusting parker <laughs> <laughs> anyway you've got to go through the ideas right to get to the right one <laughs> exactly exactly yeah um and so any- anyways i went through all this and at the end of it i was like whoa there's something really interesting here um and, and not that many people were talking about functional mushrooms at the time and so I started just experimenting and making things in my kitchen and bringing them into the office. And, you know, next thing I know, it's like people really like the product and we're starting to sell it locally. And, and p- people are like, oh, you know, are you raising money? And, and so I started to sort of really organically form as something that that may have been a viable, um, a viable business around basically including these really health nutrient dense ingredients into everyday packaged food goods. So I love these stories because you're not a bloke, you haven't grown up in a, you know, a family that manufactured some type of food product. You were a miserable, what I call, potential cubicle escapee, dying to get away from the big corporate job and working for the man. And you just, well, I wouldn't say you fell upon this idea, but, you know, it landed in your lap and you made the most of it. So tell us about that point where the inflection point where you've gone, you know what, I'm earning a good salary. I have relative security, but, yeah, what is what's security in a corporate job? I'm going to give forage a go. Yeah, so I, I had been working on it for a year. We had interns, and at this point, and I think you kind of mentioned it earlier, but we were bringing in interns, and I was baking the product locally at a cafe, but the cafe wouldn't let me store ingredients there, and I didn't want to pay for storage space, so I bought, I brought a metal rack in my bedroom, and I lived with two other roommates. We had a, a, a house in a backyard. So next thing I know, I had to bring in another metal rack and another one, and I had to get rid of all my furniture. It's just my bed these metal racks. I tried to build a hanging rack and I woke up one day and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm going to go crazy living out of here. And so I decided that I'd sleep in my tent in the backyard and I'd get rid of my bed and I just turned (laughs) into a real office. And and I said, F it. I was like, F it. Like I'm going to go through with this. Like worst case scenario, I'll just buy another bed and I'll move back into my room. Yeah. Um, so that, that was in March of, I don't know, 2020. Um, no, a little wow. bit earlier, How's March, that maybe the 20, 2019. 2019, okay, Pre, pre-pandemic. pre Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, didn't do great things for my dating life, but I, it, it gave me like a, a, a sense of excitement that I was really working on something and, and really starting to like devote all my time and effort. Parker, what woman 
I assume woman. Excuse, please excuse me if I'm wrong. I can be politically incorrect most of the time. No, you're, what, you're, you're spot on, Timbo. <laughs> what woman, Parker, wouldn't be totally interested in this young, healthy bloke who's studying mushrooms and trying to make granola and is supportive of veganism? And I mean, mate, you're a dream date. Uh, I don't know. Living in the tent didn't didn't help. Uh, oh yes, may, there's may, the downside. Before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come back to my cave, darling. Ah, cannibal liquor. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, so anyways, I, I raised that because you know it got to the point where like you know people wanted to invest. I thought, okay, we could raise some money. It's a pretty unique product. Let's go out. I told my I was in a management consultant role, and I my customer knew about my client knew what I was doing the whole time, he, and he was a two thousand dot com uh, founder. And th- their company went under with the dot com bubble, but he was always very supportive. And actually, I was I was about to quit, um, and he was like, "Hey, well, why don't you stay on part time? Just work for me, like independent consultant, and I'll keep some some cash in your in your pockets, and you can keep working on this. And like, I'll support you." Awesome. And so, my biggest piece of advice, honestly, for anybody who who is, wants to go out and start their own business, is like figure out how to make side income where you can support yeah. your lifestyle with minimal amount of hours. While you can spend the rest of your time like figuring out how to be an entrepreneur, because it's very, very difficult to get people to part from their money for anything. For anything. <laughs> I, th- for I, anything. Think that's, I think that's never a truer word spoken. Um, I've so often said on this show, make it easy for people to give you money, number one. So many businesses don't. But the other part of that is just continually remind yourself of how difficult it is to, to get hold of people's money in a genuine way. I don't mean that like as a you know, grab and run type way. I mean it as like totally. a, you know, I, I've been personally, so I've started a Patreon about a year ago and I thought, and I've been doing this podcast for 14 years. This is a bit of a, this is Tim Tim's whinge time, Parker, so just, you know, humour me. Um, but, you know, it's a great example. I've been doing this podcast for 14 years. I feel like I've built a pretty significant community. I start a Patreon to um, garnish some support from, from listeners and it's been really hard and I'm just it, it, it and it's a good reminder and wake up call that it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or how good your intentions are asking people to part with their money is difficult and we need to it's, really it's a great reminder every go to work every day thinking that and you'll sit up straight and buddy work work harder or smarter yeah and, and just as, as a, another anecdote right because i mean you'd think 15 years right what largest pod largest marketing podcast in australia mm-hmm. from what i've seen like global top 25 marketing podcast okay you would think right you have tons of repeat listeners people would want to support you yep um i there's a there's a food influencer he's the seventh largest food influencer on tiktok that, that we're working with and, and we were going to build like a private label brand out of and we were going to do everything for him and we thought okay this guy's got 25 million followers across his platforms. He's got tons of engagement. People are all over him. Mm-hmm. And we ran a, we, 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 well, we started with running a single survey to out to his followers. And it was like, Hey, I'm going to be making a protein bar. Like, would you be interested in buying it? But basically it was like, what flavors are you interested in? And less than 800 people signed up. Wow. Out of 25 million, was it? 25 million. Yeah. I now, mean, granted it's like, how many saw it? But those those number discrepancies are massive. They're massive, and and there, I, there is an assumption, and I'm guilty of it as much as others. Is that we, you, you can from the outside looking in, you can go, oh, you know, these guys are smashing it. But you know, that you, you mate with 25 million. Look, I don't know how he did that. I, I have no idea how you get 25 million followers, whoever you are. But um, it is it, it is hard. And, and you can't make assumptions just because the numbers are big that the results are going to be big as well. Parker, um, at this point, you've got your side hustle going. You've got a supportive manager in your corporate role. You're living out of your bedroom, although you've kind of been pushed out of your bedroom. You put a bed out on the balcony, which I saw a photo of in your Shark Tank pitch video. Um, yeah. At some point, you take off in a, in a Mazda van of some sort, uh, lovely, mm-hmm. colourful, rainbowish, and big forage branding on the side. You took off around America for 18 months. Is that right? Tell us about that. Why'd you do it? Yeah, just about a year. Um, I did that for, for, well, for two reasons. Um, so number one, we were trying to figure out how to market, how, how, to, how to drive, like, you know, basically direct to consumer, you know, purchases online and, and using performance marketing. So running paid ads. And, you know, we hire a big paid media company company there we're, we're spending silly money on Oops. them managing our campaigns classic yes i yeah. know i'm i'm guilty 
And, you know, the results were super lackluster. And one day I got so fed up. I was just like, all right, I need to just fucking learn. Excuse my language. I just need to learn how to do this myself. And then I will, like, I need to spend two full days just, like, figuring out paid ads. And I will, I swear by the end of those two days, like, people will come to the website and buy our freaking oh, Or at course, least find the website course. and be intrigued. The modest touch. And, and so I am out there and I'm, and I'm like, okay, I need content. And, you know, I started doing some research and, and you know, I don't, I don't watch any ads on Instagram. I, I don't pay attention to any ads anywhere. I think it's all noise. But the only ads I, I pay attention to are the ones that are just so outlandish, like completely mm-hmm. different, right? It's like really strikes through the noise. So I filmed these videos of me in my tent. And it was like, hey, like I've been living in my tent for 12 months because I think I, I've made the best granola product in the world. And it was me, like, in my tent. I looked like a hippie. It was, like, classic. And that single video drove, like, 80% of our revenue um, for the upcoming 12 months. Like, it, it was, like, an insane wow. spike. So um, let's let's, and let's it, just and unpack it, that. That's really interesting. So pr- prior to that, marketing agency doing fancy granola ads, pouring the granola into a bowl. I haven't seen them, but I'm assuming pouring mm-hmm. the granola into the bowl, sunny backgrounds, healthy people. Silly hit, yeah, you know, silly headlines, cliched stuff. You go, yeah, uh-uh, 180 degrees. Here's Parker in his tent. I'm doing it tough because I'm trying to build the best granola band. Behind the scenes, people buy into it. There's an emotional connection now. I get it. That's exactly it. And and that was such a learning for me. Like like the video quality was crap. Like I, I edited it myself. Doesn't matter, like the mate. Captions were kind of wrong. Like it exactly. It was it was such an awakening for me. Um, and ever since then, like all of our marketing efforts, it was like, okay, am I doing what everybody else is doing or, or is this truly unique? Like, will this really stop somebody in their, in their, you know, in their path and be like, what is that? Or like, wait, wait, what? And so that is really like, to me, like formed the basis of how I think about marketing in general. Like you have to be going where nobody else is going, whether that's with the type of content you're putting out, the type of ads you're running, right. The type of channels you're, you're marketing into, like, there's a lot of non-traditional channels you can be thinking about. It isn't just putting money in, into the Facebook paid paid like media what? world. Um, so I, I I straight went to guerrilla marketing, and then I also went straight to LinkedIn. So LinkedIn and then and then organic like really unique organic content um, were sort of my two bigger realms. Let's just pull those apart. So you mentioned guerrilla, organic, and then specifically LinkedIn. Okay, mm-hmm. let's let's well let's just knock the the. So what we're talking about here, we're moving into that into the non-conventional marketing discussion of which you've done a lot of and and some of it and we'll talk about you swimming out to a to a passing kayaker we'll talk about you know wacky stuff like that um because I'm interested in I mean that's fun it's a story to tell I'm interested in the ROI on that but let's just start with LinkedIn that's an easy one how is LinkedIn unconventional yeah so for me I was going on LinkedIn and I was sharing a lot of this unique content and and you know I had some couple of posts go viral so like there was one instance where whenever I would fly in an airplane, I'd always bring a whiteboard. Whiteboarding's another interesting thing that I'd love to talk about. Just go down that and rabbit I would, hole, mate. Don't, don't wait to talk okay. about it. Talk about it. Well, so I would <laughs> I would always bring the whiteboard with me, and whenever I would set up, I would set up shop anywhere and just start sampling product. I always had, like, a table in the van, a little sign, and I would always put, like, a, a, a unique message on the whiteboard to see if it caught people's attention and if they'd be interested to come and try the product. And then I was using those, like, what I what I'll call CTAs in like paid paid media. Cool so directions. I was almost testing. I was like testing like hooks and calls to action in real life on a whiteboard. Did it all the oh, time. I get it. Okay, I, th- I, th- I think I've seen your little whiteboard. It's it's quite small, maybe the size of an A three piece yep. of paper. Um, yeah. And, and and nothing fancy at all. Whiteboards and airplanes, Parker. So yes. Yeah, so, so I for a while, every single airplane I went on, I would, I would get on my whiteboard and I would write on the whiteboard something along the lines of like, of like entrepreneur with food products, like free product giveaway or something like, I don't know. It was like something along those lines. And I'd walk to the front of the airplane while we're up in the sky (laughs) and I'd walk down the airplane with holding the sign. And it's classic Timbo. It's so classic. It was such a good learning in, in human psychology. The first couple of rows, people are just like avoiding my eyes at all costs. Yeah, like yeah. it is just like they are like. But then finally, like somebody who's not really paying attention in like row four or five, like it's kind of like, oh, like, like, what are you doing? Like, what's up? And as soon as that person breaks the ice and I tell them, I'm like, oh, I'm a food founder. Like, I'm just trying to give away product to get some feedback. Like, all you have to do is is 
write your, your seat number on a piece of paper and put it in my pocket. And then and then the flight attendant will draw it and will announce it over the loudspeaker. Really? I usually was lying. I usually was lying, but then I'd actually get them to do it. <laughs> and then everybody around them, people are like, oh, like, like, okay, like, could I could I participate too? And it would like catch on like wildfire. It's really fascinating. Talk about a captive um, audience. Yeah, totally. <laughs> they're, not, they're not going anywhere. Yeah, I know, I know. I never really got yelled at either. There were there were there was one instance where the flight attendants were like, "Yeah, like stop doing this." Um, but most of the time, and, and I started to figure out which airlines as well were more lenient. But most of the flight attendants were like, "Oh, this is super cool. Yeah, like I'll announce it over the loudspeaker." I, I got on the loudspeaker a couple times. They let me get wow. on it and, and talk about the product and, and do the giveaway. And again, I have seen video of this because you, some, someone videoed it as part of your Shark Tank mm-hmm. reel. And uh, I think the bloke in, in seat 10C on this instance won a packet of granola <laughs> or something, which yeah. I, I just think it's fantastic. I, I was reflecting only the other day, Parker, on the term guerrilla marketing because we use it a lot. And I was thinking, what, why is it called guerrilla marketing? And, and I think it's because of just what you've done there. You sort of you burst in like a gorilla. You know, they just burst onto the scene. They're, one minute they're sitting down, the next minute they're sort of strolling, you know, with total intention through their forest and owning it. You know, and I think that's I, I guess that's what gorilla mar- why gorilla marketing is called gorilla marketing. I yeah, love I, it. It's 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 unclear. Um, so you know, stuff stuff like that, right? And then taking that content. Releveraging that content uh, across standard channels, but more organically, whatever organic like videos do well, then putting it, paid ad spend behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also taking that content and then trying to find partners, right? So like I reached out to Alaska Airlines for a while and was like, hey, like this crazy thing happened on the airplane. Like it'd be really, you know, like you guys really supported my small business, mm-hmm. like whatever. And I actually got like a couple intros um, and I'm still working on a potential deal to like put like, small units on Alaska airline airplanes. So nice. I don't know, like a lot of these things lead sort of to one and another, um, but it's all about like, how can you make noise and do things differently than from what others are doing? Yeah, and I think, you know, we, I mentioned ROI on this stuff before and, you know, as business owners, we want to see the ROI. We want to put a dollar here and we want to get two back. But sometimes that's flawed thinking because, and there'd be, bus- there'd be listeners out there right now going, oh, well, Geez, I mean, A, it takes guts to get up on an airplane and, you know, talk to everyone when, you know, the context of flying is people are nervous anyway about what's going to happen. Now we've got some nutter walking up and down the aisle. Um, But, and what's the ROI on that? Well, it's not an instant sale, but as you say, it has this cumulative build-up effect where Mm -hmm. you're getting the name out there, you're actually creating really interesting content uh, that you can use elsewhere, you're sharpening your sword, you are getting your pitch right real time in front of a real live audience. I mean, there's a lot of upside to doing this stuff. It just takes a lot of guts. Yeah. And, and the other you know, component of like, what's the ROI? I think I started doing like the airplane stuff and, and, and like this kayaking, you know, like when I would like swim granola out to kayakers because I was living on a floating home. So if people in kayaks would come by, I would just jump in the water and swim over and people would be very confused. <laughs> And then my roommates would like grab, like would like record it occasionally. But a lot of it was opportunistic. This wasn't like, okay, I'm going to spend, yes. you know, seven hours here and I'm going to spend that time. Like what's the ROI on my time there? It's like, oh, this is an interesting opportunity to engage with, with people in a very authentic manner. Um, and, 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 and at the end of the day, like hopefully help them feel something, right? Like Correct. people who feel real raw emotion, like that's what makes people purchase and that's what makes people follow. And then that's what, that's what helps with basically word of mouth. Right, helping people feel something. Never a true word spoken. The great definition of, of a brand is an, it's an emotional attachment. And you know, if people feel something, it's harder for them to sever the connection between themselves and the business or the brand because they're emotionally connected. If they're just buying on price, for example, they're rationally connected. Whereas you're building story and giving them reason to buy in. I guess to the forage journey. Yeah. So after I lived in the tent for close to two years, I moved into the van. So, so the van, it's upgrade. It's up, that's right. The van. So it was a 1995 Japanese import um, Mazda Bongo. Is is the uh, is is the make and model. And so like wheels on the right side, which for me is is very strange. I th- I think you guys have the wheel on the right yes. side over yes. there. 
and you know, yeah, got it fully branded. And the idea behind that was was to basically continue this this journey of building a lot of really organic content. And I went around, and, and at this point, you know, the iOS updates had happened, and like our paid media basically started doing significantly more poorly. Right? It, it was it was a lot more challenging to take good content and put paid spend behind it, and see the same ROI that like we were expecting to see, and that and that we felt was was really profitable. Um, you, you Around said, that same Parker, time, just just you said iOS yeah. updates. Did you mean Google updates? No. So uh, it may, maybe this maybe this was a US thing, but in June 2021, like Apple released the their like iOS update, and it, and it was like a security update, um, and basically they just removed a lot of trackable data points. Uh, okay. um, so like gotcha. trackable IP data points. So like paid media became overnight, you know, became a quarter as effective as, as it was Got before. It. Got it. Yeah, so, so we didn't have a ton of money. And at the same time as paid media performance fell off, we started to see some traction in, in grocery stores. So we were selling in some grocery stores and we started to see our unit, you know, sales velocity sort of picking up week over week and thought, okay, you know, I, I think like, you know, we haven't really touched on, on selling in a grocery stores yet. This could be an interesting channel but it's a beast. Like, I, I, are you familiar with with selling into retail? Yeah, very. Yeah, yeah totally. Okay. It seems I've had a few FMCG uh, business owners on over the years, and it scares me. FMCG just looks like such a yep. beast, such an expensive, complicated, hard to get to beast. Yeah, and and so I, I you know, I kind of knew that, but but in, in the similar vein, I'm thinking, okay, this is a channel that has, you know, gatekeepers and, and there's really ingrained partnerships and like everybody now, because it's COVID, it was COVID during that that point, everybody wants to get in front of these grocery store buyers who, who are kind of largely these gatekeepers, but no one's no one's go- doing anything about it except for shooting emails into the abyss now. So these grocery store buyers are yeah. getting now hundreds of emails because th- there's no more in-store meetings or there's no more in-store um, in-person meetings. There's no more trade shows. There's no more opportunities to meet these people a bit more organically. So that was why I bought the van. So I bought the van and my, and my concept was to drive around the country to these areas where these grocery store buyers were and I would and I would send them communications ahead of time and I'd say, "Hey, I'm going to drive 1000 miles to your hometown to come out, hopefully maybe have a conversation with you that is socially distanced." You know, and at that point people were kind of going into the office a little bit, but like it was still like very distanced. And so I thought, you know, what better way to stand out than to drive all the way there? And and if they don't at least give me 10 minutes of their time, like that would sort of be shocking. Mm-hmm. So it, this isn't something where like I, I just drove across the country to, to see one grocery store buyer. I scoped out the entire United States and, and really like the, the, the grocery stores that I thought we would do well in, in the chains and where those headquarters were. And I, and I, and I made the entire trip of it. So, you know, it was, and? It was just driving across the country. I would show up at, at grocery store headquarters, sometimes early in the morning, like, you know, if I knew that all the staff came in on a Monday and I would usually try and call ahead of time to figure that out, I'd show up early and I'd set up like, like a breakfast buffet right in front of the front door. So like either their security had to like throw me off out of, out yeah. of the building or like they had to walk by the table. And honestly, like we opened up you know, about 700, 800 doors of, of distribution from spending from, from the first like six, seven months on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it sort of became this thing where grocery grocery buyers in my category knew who I was because they're, they're kind of friends. And so like I'd reach out with an email and a grocery buyer would be like, oh, like I was wondering if you were going to come to me. Oh, wow. Did you, did you find on the most part, Parker, that people were respectful and enthusiastic towards meeting you? Or because it was COVID, they were like, look, I just don't want to see anyone. What was the general acceptance? Yeah, I would say generally it was it was just sort of like exciting to people. And, and, I, and I think people appreciated just like the young like hustle and like energy that I had on some levels. But there were certainly people who didn't want to talk to me at all. Mm. But the, I would say the most part, people, even, even with COVID, we would kind of be distanced and like they would still give me some time of day. Yeah. And it wasn't always an immediate yes, but it, it was... I got the product in front of them. They tried the product. They said, okay, cool. I'm not going to look at maybe putting this product on shelf maybe in for another four months, but like now there's a real connection there. I'm, I imagine too, I interviewed a, a well-known uh, FMCG fellow from Australia many years ago, Daniel Flynn from Thank You. At the time, it was a bottled water business that, that for every bottle sold helped build a well in an African village. 
Uh, and Daniel created the problem. He'd never done bottled water before, but uh, he created the problem. He got a big, big sale from uh, an independent grocery chain in Australia and all of a sudden had to manufacture some ridiculous quantity of water that he didn't even know how to do that. But he created the problem. Did you did you come in experience something similar where you got a big order and then you've gone, okay, not sure how we're going to fulfill that, but don't tell him. Yeah, yeah, I would say... That happened a little like earlier on, right when we started. And around that time, my brother was kind of like, he's in the food industry. He was managing operations and and we felt like, okay, we have to at least prepare for scale. And, and he works with manufacturers. And so sort of ahead of time, I was lucky that my brother was involved. Perfect. He was like, hey, like it, it would take us probably three to six months to onboard with a manufacturer, right? To like mm. really dial in everything. Um, and so we we started, you know, onboarding kind of right when I left. And then, you know, we, it's, we sort of got lucky a little bit with, with the timing and, and we never really ran out of major out of stocks. Something that did happen though, is we did run into product rancidity issues. Ooh. So while I was in the van, because I was so mobile, it was hard to like send myself product. Cause I didn't really know I was flexible. So quality control got defected. I was flexible, so but when I was down in Southern California and it was hot out, I would I had a ton of product in my van and a bunch of it went bad and and because I only had a finite amount, I wasn't eating it myself. I was saving it to give away as samples to relevant people. Yeah. And there there was one day where I gave out a ton of samples and and one guy called me and he's like, "Hey, like I really like this isn't I know that this is probably like what happened, but like if you've given this product out to other people, like you should strongly consider you know, figuring this out. And like, I tried a bag and it was some of the most disgusting, horrible, rancid no. food I had ever had. And and that, I still remember that feeling to this day of like, oh my God. Like, that could bring a business Heart attack down. moment. Yeah. Um, thankfully it didn't. Um, and that guy was very nice and ended up selling to him a couple months later into their chain. Um, but but oh. yeah, there's just like... <laughs> Oh, honey. Parker, the, the the unconventional marketing approach is is super interesting. It's it's entertaining. It's fun to talk about. I had a lady on a few weeks ago who had a, a silk a silk mask brand. She went to the extent of literally hopping on a plane out of Australia, hiring a car at LAX, driving to the Kardashians compound and knocking on the front door, uh, ending up with a photo of the Kardashians wearing her silk mask. It's impressive stuff. It's a great, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely, round of applause. It's impressive. Like I said, it's entertaining. As a business owner, it's got to run out of puff because all of a sudden, well, it's it's incredibly, it looks incredible, incredibly time-consuming. Um, and at some point, particularly as an FMCG brand, there's going to be an expectation by grocery store buyers that you have, you know, dare I say, a TV campaign or a, a big social media campaign, you put some serious funds behind it. I don't think they're going to buy, hey, I swim out to prospects who are kayaking past mm -hmm. my lake home. You know what I mean? Totally. And I'm, I'm, not being neg I'm, I'm not being negative here. I'm just interested in at what point does this just become child's play, I say respectfully, and you got to move in to the big boy's pants. T totally. Yeah, no, I, th I think, you know, that transition happened for me sort of, uh, maybe about 15 months ago. Like I, I came and I got off the road because it was like, all right, at that point, like we had drummed up enough business now where it's like now I actually had to manage and grow the business. Like to me, a lot of the guerrilla tactics are really good from sort of you getting you that zero to one. It's like, <clears throat> yes. how can we garner the attention, get people in the door, generate the leads and, and, and get the business to a place now that it's like you actually have something to manage and grow. That it's, like, it's, it's, it's like getting the, the first sparks of the fire. And then it's like, you know, now I probably do a lot more boring things, um, but still think about f f from a fundamental standpoint, okay, you know, from our, our marketing budget, how are we thinking about spending these funds, right? How, how much of it do we have to spend supporting these retailers and, and, and nurturing these customers in a traditional sense because it sort of works? But then, you know, what are we still doing from an experimental and, and an innovation standpoint um, in the marketing realm to basically try and to try and continue and foster that growth, um, you know, in, in a unique way that's also cost effective. 
right? I, I don't think uh, it should never end. It should be part of the brand sort of DNA, if you like, uh, internally. It's like, yeah. no, hey, on guys, we have a crack. We have a crack here. We have fun getting the brand name out there. I remember one of my first interviews many years ago was with Tom Dixon of Willet Blend, and he he was he owned a company called Blendtec, which are the blenders that you see at you know McDonald's and all the big juice mm. bars around the world. They're the big commercial blenders, and um. And his his whole marketing approach was doing these um, scientific experiments where he would sit stand there in a white lab coat, safety glasses, holding up an iPad in front of his blender and going, "This is an iPad three. The question is, will it blend?" And he'd blend the bloody iPad. But he continued to do these. He'd blend PS playstations and hockey pucks and all sorts of stuff. And my point is there. He continues. Well, he he doesn't do it anymore. This was many many years ago. But it doesn't mean you have to stop and get into adult marketing if you like. But um, yeah, there's got to be that balance. Yeah, and and I think for us too, like I you know I got to the point where I was a little bit burned out of like being the center of attention yes. and doing everything and. And we started moving more towards like digital and thinking about scaling, right? And, you know, it's like, oh, those tactics never scale. Of course not. Um, you know, and, and do I still want to like take the van around every once in a while and do something? Absolutely. But like that, instead of be 50% of my time is now five to 10, five to 10% of my time. Mm. Um, and now it's like, how can we apply? Yeah. Those same principles and that same fun cultural attitude, but just in other ways that are scaling. So like things we're working on, um, you know, our branding has become kind of really fun and, and are these cute little creatures. And so we're building and, and kind of have, have built, it hasn't been fully launched yet, um, where any customer can like scan a QR code now on our items and they can pers- they can build their own personal forager. And, it, and it's like this little creature icon. And we only feature customers foragers on like packages and all of our merchandise, et cetera. So it, it like sort of brings a slight personalization in. It keeps it fun and light, but it also like invites the consumers to like join the brand and, and be a part of that journey kind of moving forward. Um, the, the other things that the other things that, that we're sort of thinking about are, you know, a lot of our um, products focus around cognitive health. And so we've thought about, you know, like partnering with, are you familiar with Brain HQ or, or Luminosity? No. They're kind of like online, like, like mental brain training game sets. So it's like, oh, like, doing fun things with theirs. So we've developed uh, and have worked with a PhD in neuroscience to develop these like brain training games. Awesome. Um, and so like when a customer, if they want, like they can sign up for free and, and they can get these like fun, like daily brain games, like texted to them every single morning. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so we're looking at different ways of like, how can you conti- you know, consistently stay in front of a customer, you know, acquire new customers or, or nurture existing customers sort of with some of these just, I don't know, different, different methods, right, of, of reaching them. Parky, you've got balls of steel. You stand up in forty thousand feet in the air and talk to people about your product, which I absolutely love. Is there a, is there a is there a guerrilla marketing idea, an unconventional marketing idea that scares the pants off you, and you just want to you just can't bring yourself to do? I'm sure, there's many. Um, I think you know. I don't know. If, for some reason, first thing that comes to me that I think I would never do is like is like you know. Uh, what is it called? Where you strip and you run across like a like a professional football field or something? Oh, uh, yeah, streaker. Yeah, I would never streak. Wouldn't do that. <laughs> Thought that'd be the top of your list, you know, some sort of you know that's... naturalist hippie <laughs> bloke, you know, living out of his van. Uh, that's about where I where I cross. <laughs> yeah, that's about where I cross it. So no nudity. We've established no nudity. <laughs> okay, tell me, Parker, you are building a business, a brand. Um, in a very big marketplace, everyone eats breakfast. Well, most eat breakfast. Granola is popular. This has the potential, all being well, to be a really big empire, serial empire, whatever you want to call it. Is that your intention or where do you want to see Forage in, I always hate saying five years' time, but this is a long-term question. Where do you see it? Yeah, I, th- I think for me, you know, Timbo, I, I think as I've learned more about business and, and what I enjoy and life and, and think about, you know, what do I want to get, get away with my time here? I don't think, at least right now, I really want to be a CEO. Yeah, I can't so figure that. What, what, what that means for me is like, I think once the brand gets to a certain point, 
I think I'd be interested in bringing in an operator and, you know, whether that's, whether that's selling the brand or, or bringing in someone and, and kind of stepping away, but still being there to engage and, and make sure everyone's having fun and, and finding joy and creativity, like absolutely. But I, I genuinely do think, you know, I'm, I'm really most passionate about building in that, you know, zero to one or zero to five or zero to 10 space of like really going from absolutely nothing and creating something um, and then bringing it up to a place where there's processes in place um, but I think, you know, much beyond that, I, I don't love just like managing people and processes and, um, you know, bringing something from 10 to a hundred, right. Or 10 to a thousand or, or, you know, whatever, just the massive scale. I, I'm so glad you've recognized that in yourself. This is, this is the father figure in me talking Parker, but you know, <laughs> I think it's called the Peter principle where you get promoted or, or you promote yourself beyond your level of competence. And we see it all the time. And one of the biggest examples that comes to mind for me is a, a very past guest, I think maybe in my first or second year of this show, his name was Brian Singer, and he founded Rip Curl. Do you know Rip Curl, the, brand, the surf oh, yeah. brand? Everyone knows Rip Curl, right? Big brand. Now, he founded that brand because he used to surf at a beach, at his local beach called Bells Beach down in Torquay in Australia, and it was freezing. And he came across this neoprene material bought a World War II sewing machine and made the first wetsuit. And here he is out in the middle of winter surfing Bell's Beach and his mates are going, can you make me one? Can you make me one? So he made everyone a wetsuit. Anyway, the ne- decades later, Rip Curl is this multi-billion dollar global surf brand and I won't go as far as saying he was miserable because he was very wealthy and he was surfing a lot still. But he was taken away from the heart and soul of where he started because he just, it, the thing grew and maybe he didn't have the courage to make the decision you have, which is, I don't want to be a CEO. I, I really, I hope that works for you. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm still young and, and you know, I'm sure I, my, I know I changed my mind, but it's just, I, I, I'm just not super financially motivated either. <laughs> right. Which I, maybe sounds crazy. Don't beat yourself up over that, buddy. <laughs> maybe I'm lying to myself. Some people think I am. You're gonna, you'll love this, Timbo. I'm, I'm dating this this girl, and she, she she's a, she's an entrepreneur, and and she's she's excited at the opportunity to get you know financially wealthy and secure. Uh-huh. And I tell her, and I'm like, I think I think you may end up coming to realize that like that's not that's not necessarily it. And and the other day she, she we're we're hanging out, and she goes she goes you know if you ever want to admit that or if you ever want to admit that you'd like to be rich someday. You can tell me, and I won't tell anyone. She goes, I swear I won't tell anyone, but you can share that with me. And I'm like, that's just not me, babe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's part of your generation too. You know, I've got three kids uh, slightly younger than you, and I talk to them about this, and it isn't about necessarily building empires. Of course, there are people out there who are always going to want to do that, but it'll be interesting to see how you sort of manage that because even if you put a CEO in, the CEO is going to want to build an empire. Unless the brief is, hey, listen, once we once we're turning over ten million bucks, turn the tap off and put the price up, or something like that. You know, stop further growth, just increase margin. Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> and who knows, right? Who knows? It's so uh, it's hard to say, right? I, th- I think time will tell, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's like if, if I think if I'm being honest and I look in the mirror, like there's a lot of other things that I want to do that have nothing to do with building a business. Like I'd love to be a kindergarten teacher. I don't know why. I, I can't defend that. I like kids. Like I, I think that'd be a really fun. And I think if I laid on my deathbed one day and I was si- silly rich because I had spent all of my years building a, a, a business, my nose to the grindstone, I think I would, would be quite upset um, at the life that I've lived versus if I got there one day and, you know, maybe I'm wealthy, maybe I'm not, but I had, you know, was a kindergarten teacher and did these other things that I really wanted to do. I I don't know. That's that, that's oh, what I, I think it. I'd like to be. I totally honour what you just said, Parker. And as a 56-year-old bloke, uh, I'd be lying if I said there weren't things where I go, I wish this or I wish that. And I'm, I'm sure everyone else listening of of age um, would, would, would say the same. There's a great blog post written by um, a, ner- a palliative care nurse. It's called Five Wishes of the Dying. And it has had, it's probably one of the most famous podcasts in the uh, podcast blog, blog posts in the world. That may be a slight exaggeration, but it's had millions and millions of reads. Um, and she's just, you know, she's she's helped facilitate 
people dying for years. It's her job and she's come down to these five things. And, you know, one of them was, I think one of them literally was, you know, I won't be on my deathbed wishing I'd made more social media posts or, you know, it's, there's a bit of humour about it too. But, yeah, well, I hope you do become a kindergarten teacher, Parker, because uh, that's a noble job and there's not enough male ones of them. I say to one of my boys, he'd be a great primary school teacher, but, you know, he's a bit stuck on on building a little content creation business. And I'm like, oh, well, do that for the time being, but hopefully there's an opportunity to to do something else down the yeah, track. who knows? Parker, what would you say, just to wrap things up, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Um, and, and by the way, thank you for chasing me down because, um, listeners, Parker, first of all, pitched me months ago. We, we um, locked in something, had to cancel it. I ignored him for a period of time because I had other stuff on, but he kept at me. And, and here he is today. So, again, there's lessons in that, you know. Um, you know, you emailed me a few times, Parker, like, you're still there, just test, just checking, um, and many would have given up. But, you know, you, you, people have other shit on, right? So, we, of course, <laughs> this is how it works. What's your advice, Parker, to the small business owner listening who is a little bit scared about the marketing approach that you have would love to try something. Yeah, I think, you know, I think once you get out of your comfort zone once or twice, it can be really, really quite addicting. Um, and it's really scary. I, th- I think I think the most scary part is is the first step. But but I guess my piece of advice, and this is something I do all the time, Timbo, and, I, and I'm actually curious if you ever do this, but I almost use an alter ego to help enable me to do these things that I find really scary. I'm terrified every single time I go up on that airplane. But in my mind, I almost use an alter ego, like like it's almost a doppelganger effect where I'm like, okay, well, man, like this would be really good content. This content would be really good for the business. And I justify my behavior by by saying and, and convincing myself that like this is what the business needs or, or, or this could be a, you know, a leg up for the business or whatever. And I almost use the title of founder to justify some absurd behavior that I do. Uh, so uh, I love it. I, I, in fact, I was only reflecting the other day, you call me Timbo, and many people do call me Timbo. I've heard of myself as Timbo. But sometimes it is a bit of an alter ego, you know. If um, uh, It allows me to step into a, a slightly larger-than-life version of who I really am, you know. Hmm. But I think, too, as business owners – I talk business owners, but it applies to just us humans generally, is that um, depending on our situation, we have a number of levers that we can activate. And that, you know, one, you know, if I'm at a networking event, then I might activate my more formal, you know, less less gregarious self. And if I'm at a, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm doing a keynote, then I might amp up the humour and the, you know, the, gregar- the gregarious nature of what I'm talking about. So, yeah, you, you play to your strengths depending on where you're at at that point in time. Yeah, Totally. Good stuff, Parker. I wish you all the best with Forage, man. Uh, I wish you even more success as a kindergarten teacher. I hope that happens <laughs> one day. You know, I've never heard of the kindergarten teacher side hustle, but hey, you know, <laughs> be unconventional. It would be, yeah. That's the that's the plan, Timbo. That's the plan. Forage dot co. F O R I J dot co. I love the name, by the way. It's it's uh, thank you. It, it speaks volumes. All right, Parker, love your work, mate. Thanks for sharing. Cheers. Well, there you go, team. Unconventional marketer and founder of Forage, Parker Olson. I do love a marketing risk taker. I've got to tell you, there's a lot to love about the way he's growing Forage, and it makes me wonder why don't more of us roll up our sleeves and take on some unconventional marketing ideas. At least have one in the mix at any one time. Do what you're doing, right? Do what's working but just add a little bit of unconventionality to the way you get heard, to the way you break through the clutter, to the way you get you and your precious business noticed. If you'd like to watch that interview, then feel free to lash out and join my uber expensive membership over at patreon.com forward slash marketing podcast. First seven days are free. I'll hopefully see you on the inside. Quick update on where the podcast is at, uh, it is the end of the year. I never mention the date when I do an episode because I try to make all my content dateless 
timeless, evergreen. But it is the end of the year. I am going to take a break uh, for most of February, if not all of February. Uh, and I'll be back with at least a couple of episodes a month. Um, we'll absolutely continue to do my Patreon, my small business owner membership over at patreon.com forward slash marketing podcast. That really does help keep the show alive, team. Uh, getting sponsors, uh, I'm running out of gas a little bit on the whole getting sponsors thing. Um, 14 and a half years, um, and I'm not admitting defeat by any stretch of the imagination, but right now I'd like to crowdfund uh, the future uh, of this podcast, and that means uh, you getting involved, if you can, in any way, shape or form. Uh, that would be great. But I love doing this. I love bringing marketing insights to you, and they will absolutely continue and uh, if you've got anything you'd like to hear covered, a topic uh, that you want me to cover inside my small business owner membership or on the podcast, then feel free to let me know. Tim at Tim Reed, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U is where you'll find me. But most importantly, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to get this far in this episode and for listening to the podcast. Have a wonderful 2024 and I'll see you on the flip side. Righto, it's time for you to take action on what you've learned because ideas remain exactly that without action. Just go and implement something. That would be my best advice. If you enjoyed today's app, please hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app where you will find 662 more chats with successful business founders. And there are just so many insights, ideas, strategies, tactics, motivations, call them what you will in that archive of 662 interviews. A big thanks to editor Sam Heathcote for stitching the marketing gold together and to our in-house rock star Lockie Dolly for the wonderful music bed. Most importantly, a big thank you to you for lending me your ears, for tuning in and for being the wind beneath my wings. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.